Hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ariel. Now, a couple of years ago, I would have completely introduced myself differently. I would have said, hi, my name's Riley, and I use he, they pronouns. That's because I was part of the LGBTQ community. Nowadays, I'm no longer part of this community because of the light that God has shed on this problem for me. Um, for those of you who don't know what the LGBTQ community is, a simple explanation is anyone who's part of the LGBTQ community basically identifies as something that is not their biological gender or has attractions to people of the same gender or being gay. This is just the very simplistic out of all of the labels that they use. Now some of you might be thinking, all right, so what are you going to talk about? Well, God has put on my heart on uh, talking about how being part of the LGBTQ community is a sin. Many of you guys are probably thinking, well, of course being gay is a sin. But for many Christians and many people, including myself, when I identified as Riley, it's not that clear what the Bible says because of all the lies that we're being fed. Now, to start this off, I'm going to say this. What I'm about to say is not to shame anyone who might identify as part of the LGBTQ community. What, that's not my goal. My goal is to share the revelation that God showed me to all of you. The common arguments you may hear from pro-LGBTQ Christians is that God made us, and so he must have made me gay. There's nowhere in the Bible that says being gay is a sin. Or God loves me so much, it doesn't matter. I can be LGBTQ. These are all arguments I heard and I believed. But all of these arguments are false. Let me provide some proof. First off, the Bible does say being gay is wrong. In many Bible passages, you can find the words, a man shall not lie with a man as he does with a woman. Many of those passages carry on saying how it is, a dete how it is detestable. Take Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood is on their own heads. Now, the lie that is usually spread about this verse is that it's been mistranslated. And it's supposed to say, if a man has sexual relations with a boy, as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their death will be on their own heads. However, even if this verse is mistranslated, there are many other verses that also talk about how homosexuality is wrong. Take Leviticus 18.22, which says, don't have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Another argument is that the Bible only states that homosexuality is a sin in the, Old in the Old Testament, and it's different nowadays. If that was true, we wouldn't have Romans 1, 18 to 27, which is found in the New Testament. Now bear with me, because this is a longer passage. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may have since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have, clearly, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and foolish, and, and their hearts foolish. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Apologies. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images that looked like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires for their hearts to... Therefore, God gave them over to, in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is praised forever. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned their natural relations and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. 
Now, I share this whole passage because I don't like to passage pick. However, let me highlight one key part of this passage. Because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their woman exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for this error. This passage clearly shows and describes how sexual relations with the same gender are shameful lusts. Also, if the, Bible didn't, if the Bible did support homosexuality, why do so many verses say, and a man shall leave his mother and father and be one with his wife? Now, I've made my point about homosexuality, but what about identifying as another gender? Most of the arguments you, you might hear to defend this are, God must have made a mistake in the body he put me in. God made me, so he must have made me feel this way. Or the most common one I hear is this, God made animals, and many animals can change their gender. So, if God made animals that way, it's okay for me to change my gender. Once again, all of these arguments I heard and I believed. However, many places in the Bible show how these arguments are false. Let's start with the one about God making a mistake. In Psalms 139, verses 13 to 16, the writer writes, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days of... All the days for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. My question is this. If the creator of all things saw us and formed us, how could he make a mistake? And if he can't make mistakes, why would he put you in a body that you're not supposed to be in? These feelings don't come from God. They come from our sinful nature. To address the third argument about animals, yes, God didn't make animals that can change their gender, like the clownfish. However, there are two key differences between animals and us. One, God didn't breathe the breath of life into them. They are not made in his image. As the Bible says in Genesis 2, verse 7, Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Second, animals can change gender because it's in their DNA. If God truly designed us to be transgender, would it not be in our DNA? I'll finish off this part by restating this. I'm not here to shame you. However, I'm here to shed light into the darkness. Now let me give a piece of advice for those who are not LGBTQ, but don't know how to deal with an LGBTQ friend or family member. Start with this. Understand what it's like. How I used to explain it to my oldest brother was like this. Imagine one day you woke up and you were in a different body than you had been in the day before. The body you woke up in was female. It felt wrong. You had breasts that you never did before. How would you feel? For girls, you woke up in a body that you never had been in before. Your breasts were gone. You had a penis. How would you feel? You would probably feel disgusted, shameful, out of place, uncomfortable. That's what it feels like to be transgender. Now, I'm not saying that this feeling is correct, or right, or from God, but I'm trying to get you to understand. The second step is to be there to listen. Be loving, be caring, be a friend first first and foremost, and let God work through you. Now, the biggest issue for Christians today is, what do we do about preferred names and pronouns? I'm not going to give you an answer to this because I'm still learning what to do. However, I have a piece of advice that may be able to guide you. Above all, love and speak the truth. I hope I've been able to shed some light on this issue with you and that you've learned something. Feel free to come, after, feel free to, come to me after the service and ask any questions. I'll try my best to answer. Thank you. All right, first I want to thank Pastor Kerry for giving me this opportunity again to preach. Um, I also want to thank the Lord for giving me the word and uh, what to speak today. So let's start. My title for this preach is Trust in the Times When the Lord Seems Far Away. 
has anyone felt this feeling before where he seems far away? One where you tell God that he's far away, but you don't seem like he listens to you. When we feel like the Lord is far away, he's actually near us, waiting for us to trust in him. Let's start with the word uh, of the Lord. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6, 16 to 18. It says, Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside was, around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. As the Armenian army advanced towards him, Elisha prayed, O Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. You may be familiar with the story, but for those who need a refresher, uh, this is Elisha and a boy telling the king of Israel about, the king, uh, about what King Aram uh, is doing with the military. Every time Aram's military mobilizes to attack, Elisha tells the king of Israel what they're about to do and where they are. This obviously upset King Aram, and he found out that it was the prophet Elisha that was doing this. So he decided to uh, attack or capture Elisha, leading to the verse. Here, I saw this verse as a lesson for us that whatever you may face is not greater than God. He's, he himself said that before you, and he will fight for you. Doesn't it feel great that our God is fighting for us every time? What Elisha was doing here was following God's command. It's that simple. He wasn't doing anything different. This explains why everything was working out for him. And how did the boy see? It's because he removed his fears and opened his eyes towards God. He opened and he listened to what God was asking. In accordance with what God has said to the boy, he indeed said to us, open your eyes and do not be afraid. So you can see what God is doing in your life, for that's when we see the true works of God. We have to practice trusting the Lord with everything, from the smallest things to the biggest decisions we have right now. This is scary to do so, so sometimes you don't know what to do or what you think about the choice presented to you. But whatever you might think is going on, it's him who has the say. And it's your job to fear the Lord. For Psalms 103.11 says, As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards uh, those who fear him. We must acknowledge that neither God nor the Bible advise of worrying or stressing over anything. Instead, it says to trust the Lord and believe him. It says especially in Proverbs 3.5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. This is one of my favorite verses of all time because it always reassures me that no matter what I'm facing in life, positive or negative, uh, unfair or otherwise, I can handle adversity because, I mean, we all do, right? I remember this verse because I put my trust in the Lord rather than what I feel at that time because it's not always right. I have learned that listening to our heart doesn't always yield to good results. So let our hearts not be led by worry or fear, for the Lord has given us peace. As it says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. God is saying that he will give us peace that will not be found anywhere else. Like Jesus said to the Samaritan woman when she asked for water, he said that he will give her water that will never make people thirsty ever again. God will provide us with peace that even the world doesn't have. Now, God has given us peace. He has mercy towards anyone who fears him. And he will also make us fruitful if we trust in him. Then why are we always thinking he's far away or he doesn't listen? Well, one reason I believe this happens is because we expect God to come after us for everything we want. That's not true. I mean, let's say I'm choking right now and expect someone to just look at me and say, oh, you know, and then I'll help you. Um, that obviously won't add up. You have to make noise if you can um, or bang the table, signal the person. You have to let them know. You have to ask them. 
so uh, to get attention, right? The, mem uh, the moral of this example is that of Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock on the door and it will be opened to you. Meaning, after God has given us mercy and knowledge, if we trust in him, then all we have to do is ask the Lord for what we want and you shall receive. We can't expect to get whatever we want without asking the provider and source, but we have to also realize that not all the things we ask comes. This is because God knows what's good and bad for you. Because you might be asking for something bad or something that distracts you from the will of God and he has to limit you, he has to set boundaries. Sorry. My last point is that God will give us strength. Isaiah 40, 29 to 31 says, He gives us power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will, be, uh, will become weak and tired, and young men will fall into exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They'll soar high on their wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Did you guys catch that? It says young men will fall into exhaustion. Us youth grow weary, but we get strength. Who gives us that strength? It's God. God gives us the strength. Look back in your life. Do you remember the times you have fallen down whenever you were tired or you needed help? When you trusted God through that problem, it got fixed. You got renewed strength. That's God's promise. He will strengthen us when we grow weary and only he will give us strength if we trust in him. Because God is encouraging us to trust in him and we will receive these uh, benefits. Now, if we add all the benefits and requirements, it's simple. What God will provide us is uh, strength, mercy, peace, and things that we have asked for. But he only requires us to trust in him and ask for it. To be honest, it's easier said than done. But we have so much time in our hands to do this on a daily basis. We have to start small and get used to it. And God will give us strength as a form of encouragement. To summarize, listen to the Lord. Don't be afraid of what might happen, especially if God says it will happen. Instead, be happy that God made it happen. Like what God did to the boy and Elisha, we should ask the Lord not to be blinded by our fears and ultimately trust the Lord with all our hearts. God is always with us and he's fighting for us. I mean, did you know when God sent people to war back then, they didn't even, he always fought for them. Sometimes they didn't even have to fight because God just scared them off because he just wanted us to listen to him and then everything will work out later. We also talked about how in Psalms 103, 11, it says, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. The Lord will give us mercy so long as we fear him. God also assures us that our hearts should not be troubled, but we have to trust in the Lord with all our hearts instead of following our own wants. Another point I talked about was the practice of asking what you need, because the word says to ask so you can receive, but we also talked about there are limits over what you should ask. We have also learned that we have God's encouragement in the form of renewed strength instead of or eliminating the weakness and there's only one thing to do trust to receive strength all in all we have to trust in the times when the lord seems far away to end off i'll leave you guys with the word jeremiah 29 13 to 14 it summarizes the whole preach and says and you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart i'll be found by you says the lord and I'll bring you back from your captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I'll bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Thank you. So um, I must admit that when Pastor Kerry first asked me to preach, I said yes kind of fast. <laughs> and then I thought about it after and I was like, oh, so nervous, but I pray the Lord's with me. And I just want to start by sharing the story of Mary and Martha. So, um, and this is found in Luke 10, verse um, 38. 
Now, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now it happened as they went that he entered a village, a, a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet. Um, sorry. Um, he sat at Jesus' feet and to hear his word. But Martha was distracted um, with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which is not to be taken away from her. So, I mean... I, like Martha, have sometimes felt like distracted by things and I just want to, like there's so many things to do in a day and I kind of have been put, like God has been put on the back burner in my life sometimes and honestly when I, I, and I don't want to live like that and I mean haven't you guys been busy before? Or you think, okay, well, I'll just, I'll do it later. I'll pray later. Or, you know, I'll have time for God later. Don't worry. But, and I feel like when I do that in my life, it's kind of, it feels more of like a going through the motions instead of, you know, I actually get to sit and spend time with my father. And I love it. I find so much joy in it. But I find that it's hard to get there. Like so many distractions come in. And I just, it's, it's a struggle for me, honestly, and in my walk with God, I've struggled to get to that point where it's like, okay, now I'm sitting and I can spend my time with him. And um, so that's just, I felt really distracted in my life, and the Lord's put on my heart to just speak on it, and that he loves spending time with you, and he, you just, you should want to spend time with him because it only benefits you and connecting with your father more. I mean, how are you supposed to get to know him if you don't ever spend any time with him? And um, he's honestly, I have felt like that conviction where it's like, I could be spending time with the Lord right now, but then I'm like, oh, I have a show I want to watch. And, but I just feel like that once you understand how important it is and how much it can like create like an amp, an avalanche effect of like growing deeper in your faith once you sit with him and even I got to the point where it's like I'm sitting in here with him I'm talking I'm praying and then okay it's time to go now <laughs> goodbye God <laughs> I'll see you next time and I just that does help you get close to God like spending time with him is good but recently I've discovered that you want to sit with God and to hear his voice like you have to sit and listen and I wasn't very good with that. Um, I would, again, just let, like, the distractions of, like, I have to do other things, so I would get up and go. And in that, I didn't hear from God a lot. And I just want to encourage you guys to sit with the Lord so that you're able to hear his voice on matters. Like, not, it doesn't have to be the, like, oh, something super important, I have to go to God and talk about it right now. You definitely should go to him about those things. But also, like, just the little things a part of your day talk to him and listen for his answer on things and wisdom and guidance and reading the word helps you able to identify like is this really from God because sometimes I'm like God is that my voice or your voice and I'm that type of person where I want you to double confirm it and just reading the word just definitely helps you to differentiate the, between the two and um just as of lately I had this dream that very much troubled me and I went to the Lord and I prayed about it and then I sat and waited and I got nothing, and it completely discouraged me, and I was, I was actually upset, and I didn't want to go back and pray about it. I was like, you know what, I'm going to just waste my time, and I'm not going to hear anything again, and I was, I, yeah, it was just, it completely discouraged me from spending my time with the Lord, but then I talked with Matthew, and he actually helped me to realize that it's, you have to sit with him a bit longer maybe this time, and then he will bring it to you, the revelation that you need. So sit with him longer and don't get discouraged that if you don't get the answers you're looking for right away. Because God, honestly, he wants you to sit with him. And it was explained to me, like, if you sit and ask God for something, and then he gives you the answer, and then you just get up and go after that, then that's done. Like, your time with him is done. But he wants you to sit with him longer and actually just soak in his presence. And it's just such an amazing, overwhelming feeling of love. And that's how you get your like the two-way conversation, so it's not just you talking to God and then you don't wait for his response, right? So I just wanted to encourage you guys. Um, 
with that and um, here, wait. Um, yeah, so uh, for me, what helped me to like stop like the distraction was to I have to go into like my basement at home and which is like, I would say, go somewhere you know you can't be bothered. Like I leave my phone upstairs and I go down, downstairs where it's like I don't have the distractions of my family or anything and I sit in quiet with the Lord, which is, you know, in um, Matthew 6, um, verse 6 says, but you, but you, when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in, who's in the secret place. And your father who sees, um, sees, in the, sees you in secret will reward you openly. So I just want to say that, yeah, like take time to go to God, with God, be alone with him, and sit there in it. And when I did that, I was in my basement, and I was in there for hours. Um, I just literally laid on the floor, and I was like, okay, God, this is the dream. I need you to please just reveal what you want me to know. And I just sat there and I waited for a long time and he did reveal to me some things or to the point, I didn't get everything, but to the point where I feel better about it. So I do have to go back to him. So I just want to leave you guys with that God loves you and he wants to spend time with you and he just wants as much as your time as he can get, right? So you should really just know that how important it is to you and make having it become a priority in your life. And for me, I struggled with making it like the biggest priority in my life, which I know people have always said to do, but I was like, okay, but what does that look like practically? Like in my life, I have a lot of things that do consume my time, but honestly, there's nothing more fulfilling than making God number one. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting the way I'm going to preach about. <clears throat> um, okay, so for the record, like, I did not plan to preach today, like, but I just came here, and I felt like I learned something really important this week that I wanted to speak from my heart, uh, that I feel like really has genuinely like changed the way I look at things in general. So, just to start off, like, I feel like over like say the past two weeks, I've felt like I've been in a really like low point with the way I'm perceiving a lot of things, and that a lot of that has come from just the way I ex what I expect out of my daily life. So just in terms of like. You know, I'm in grade 12 right now, so like universities, um, my grades, uh, other things like relationship, productivity, like what I get on a daily basis. And I feel like if I don't reach these expectations, I just reach like a slow point where I just lose all motivation on what I'm going to go do next. And a verse that really struck to me was um, in their hearts, humans plan their, their course, but the Lord established their steps, Proverbs 16, 9. And here's the thing. I established my own plan, but I didn't really look at what the God had for me. So I feel like that's definitely a big part of why I was sort of like checking downhill and feeling really low. But um, I'm going to be really speaking from uh, Matthew 6 today uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. It's a really great um, just piece of work that Jesus preached in Matthew. It was, I think, three chapters. I think Taya talked a bit about that earlier just now um but like yeah what i want to say my main points are is that god has everything you need and worrying about what's going to happen next doesn't benefit your life and focus on god and your current worries will fail to consume you and you'll focus on what he really has planned for you so i'm just going to start off with saying yeah god has everything that you need and in matthew 6 um chapter, yeah, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 um, says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, nor what you will put on. Is life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow uh, nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Just shows that like if God is able to take care of the animals, if the animals don't care about what's going to happen next because they know that God is has what's coming for them next, why should we, you know? And it's really hard for that to happen, even especially when, like, stop, setbacks come our way, anything that, like, sort of we perceive to be bad. But now that I'm really looking at, like, even, like, the bad things that have happened to me, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate, but, like, I feel like it definitely happened for a reason and that we wouldn't be where we were without our setbacks. So, it's like, I feel like just looking through the eyes, like, your setbacks or, like, Thing, the bad things that happen to you, they happen for a reason. And that just because they happen to you doesn't mean God isn't giving you everything you need. So next, I also want to talk about uh, 
worrying does not benefit your life. And I'm saying that from Matthew chapter, oh my days, Matthew chapter 6, verse, um, I'm kind of a literary right now, so I can't find it, but it's like, I remember the verse for hand. It's like, what, what? What like day, what uh, how many hours do you benefit from worrying? You know, so literally worrying doesn't help you at all. It, it, if you keep focusing on oh wow God why is God forsaking me why is He doing all this it's not gonna help you. And if you keep setting your eyes on the things that God has in place for you to help you grow, instead of seeing how it can help you, it's not gonna. It's not going to end well. And that takes me to my next point. So instead of focusing on our worries, we should focus on God. And when we do focus on God, our current worries are going to fail to consume us. So as Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So when we focus on God, when we focus on gl glorifying him and what he has for us, instead of focusing on just what we want and just being selfish towards our needs, then we'll know we'll see that a lot of the things that we already ha had, like we'll we'll know that a lot of things we were looking for we had in the first place, and if we didn't have them, it happened for a reason. So just to summarize what I had, what I've said today, just God has everything you need. Worrying does not benefit your life, and focus on God, and your current worries will fail to consume you. And it's definitely really hard when. Like you had this plan, you had something in place that you thought was going to succeed and it didn't succeed. And it's, it's definitely not easy to just like snap your fingers and just say, okay, I don't care anymore. You know, everything's a process. Like healing is a process. Like just recovering is a process in general. But uh, what I learned and I hope what you guys can take from today is that don't worry. It doesn't benefit you. And just focus on the kingdom of God. Amen. All right. Um... Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I I had um, when I was preparing this, I was like just really like not satisfied with what I had to say, but um, Holy Spirit's kind of giving me peace about it, and I'm just I'm I'm praying like He's gonna do the rest of the work here, but um, yeah, I'm praying that like what I have to say like still blesses someone, and um, yeah, um, I wanted to talk today about dying to self. Um, it's not something I'm really an expert in. And like really, I'm like I've been struggling with it a lot, but like I believe the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart to talk about it for a reason, and I hope that the perspective I bring to this will help someone. Um, but yeah, first thing I wanted to do is just like define it, like what does it actually mean to like die to self? You know, I just wanted to go back to the basics, and um, for, for for the first thing is like there's like kind of two parts to it. The first part like comes like when the first time you die to self is when you become like born again. That's when you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then when you become born again, it means like your old self dies and your new self comes alive. You know, like when you come into Christ, you become a new creation. You know, old things have passed away, all things become new. Second Corinthians 5.17. But um that and that's just the first part. But we don't just stop at being born again. Um and you know, in the like just think of it in the physical sense. Like after you're born, you still you still have to like grow up, you know. You have to learn things as you grow up and you have to be taught certain things so that you can function properly in society. It's the same concept spiritually. Like when you first come to Christ, you're a newborn, but you can't just stay there. You know, um, you have to grow up, and God, God has to teach you things and show you things so that you can you can grow spiritually. Because like even though we become new creations after we become born again, there's still elements in our old nature that we have to replace with our new nature. And within and within that process, we're essentially killing those old elements, killing that old self. Like. Like it's an, and it's an ongoing process. I don't think, and I know like most people here, like we're all we're all still going through that process, you know. So it's like it's just killing that old nature within ourselves and replacing it with the new nature that God is teaching us to walk in. Um, yeah. And so the verse I came across while preparing this was um, Matthew 16, uh, verse 24 to 25, and and here Jesus said to his disciples, "Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me." For whoever wants to serve their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And there's like there's a lot there's a lot loaded in these two verses, but um, like there's like three three main points, and it was like and the three main key words I I found here was like first first was like denying yourself, and that's like denying your flesh, denying your your natural physical desires, all the things that you know your like physical self wants to do, but then 
those, those things will, will be good for your flesh, not necessarily good for your spirit. Um, and the first, first one was like, and the second one was like, take up your cross, you know? And I had to like kind of figure out like, I had to like really just like, d d like dig deep and figure out like what, what this actually means. But like in the literal sense, of course, it's like pretty much like walking to your death, preparing to your death, you know, preparing to be crucified. And I was reading it like, it's actually, there's actually like, like being crucified is probably one of the most painful, like excruciating and slow like ways to actually like to die. And like, and just like thinking and just reflecting on how like, how much Jesus went through just for our sake, you know, just like, you know, it was just like being, being pierced on the cross and like all like, like all like the blood and everything that was like that that he shed for us like it's like it's it's really just crazy to think about um but like the one the one part i really wanted to focus on today was like it's just the part where it says follow me and that's something i've like really like struggled with a lot and it's just like that obedience and that's yeah just what i want to focus on today like it's such a simple thing but honestly it's been one of the hardest things for me to do like in my in my walk because like sometimes god can be telling you to do things that you would have never really imagined yourself doing and it's like, I'll just give an example. Like sometimes, like, like as I know, like you've just been walking somewhere, or been on the street, and you see someone, and God kind of just like makes, you, like, kind of, like makes you look at that person, and it's like, I, I want you to go talk to them. And it's like, every time I hear this, I'm just like, God, why me? Like, why now? I wasn't prepared for this, and there's like a million other thoughts and objections, like that, in, that are in my head that are like against me talking to this person. Or it's like, oh Lord, someone else can do it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready. I don't, I don't feel like talking. I don't feel like talking right now. And sometimes it can just be like the absolute worst time. Like maybe you just like, you just like finished work or something, and you just had like had a bad day, and you don't just don't feel like talking talking to anybody. But like, whatever the reason is, like there's all there's always those like oh like what if thoughts or like I don't want I don't think like I'm good enough to 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 like to talk to them or just something that will prevent you from doing what he's actually like instructed you to do. And like, yeah, like that's just our first instinct, you know, like in the natural sense, it's just to focus on our own abilities, on what we have to do, what steps we need to take to like, to like follow what he's saying. Um, you know, it's, we want to like rely on our own knowledge and think logically about the situation, how to go about it. And like, usually when we do that, we feel like inadequate, not good enough, unqualified. And yeah, this is part of like what I preached about in, in my, like in the main auditorium a few months ago. Um, and the verse I quoted there was um, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5, which, is, which says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And uh, what that verse, like, in short, what that verse tells me is that it's not about me. It's not about, like, what I, what I know. And I have to remember, that, like, compared to God, I have an extremely limited view on whatever situation he's put, he's put me in. And all of my abilities, all of my skills and talents, like he's the one that gave them to me anyways. And just like, just to reflect a, a bit as well, like this, this is something like, I've put a lot of pride into like what I can do, like my skills and talents and stuff like that. And um, it's just, but I, I, always, I always just have to like, ref, like, just like humble myself and just remember like, that's not where my identity is. It's not my identity, my identity is in Christ. And it's not, it's not just in the skills and talents that he gave me. So it's not something I need to rely on or be dependent on, you know? Yeah, like, he's my source. All I have to do is, like, just be humble and be obedient to him and listen to him, you know? And yeah, just on the topic of humility, there's this really interesting quote that I heard some months ago. Um, it says, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Um, it's really interesting. I thought, I thought C.S. Lewis wrote this. Apparently, it was uh, Rick Warren. But C.S. Lewis actually wrote something that was even better, which says, like, a, a truly humble person doesn't even think about humility. Like, they don't think about themselves at all. So it's like, it just, all this is just, it's just to drive home the point that you don't need to think about your own abilities when you're doing something that God has instructed you to do. And, you know, when he gave the instruction, he accounted for the fact that you'll make mistakes, you know. Someone else put it really plainly, like, when God called you, he factored in your stupidity, you know? Like, he factored in the fact that like, he's gonna, like, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna mess up. So, like, you just have to, you know, just, like, it's, it's a learning process, you know? You, like, you don't have to do everything perfect the first time, but I think the, the important part is just to follow him and trust him. And I know, Louis, you touched on this a little bit. Like, I'm really, I'm really glad you did, because, like, um, yeah, it was something that, it's, like, it's been on my heart as well, and I'm just, I'm really glad you shared, shared that, like, just, Trust in him, you know, um, you know, in that, like in that, in that very moment, like it's just, we have to remember that it's our weakness that God, that, that's, it's within our weak, 
weakness when God is really able to show his strength. You know, and it's, um, I, I saw in um, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, um, this, is, this is Paul's writing, and the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul said, and Paul in response to this said, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may, may rest on me. And that's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, and yeah, it's just to, it's just to remember that we're not reliant on our own, on our own strength. We're not reliant on our own, um, like on our own knowledge. It's all, it's all, it's all that we're all, we're always dependent on God in every single aspect. Um, and to remember that like in everything, we just have to ask him what to do and he'll, he'll tell us like how exactly it's going to go. Um, he'll tell like, well, maybe not exactly how it's going to go, but he'll, he'll tell us what to do. And like, we just have to trust that like he knows, he knows better than us. He always does. So we have to trust that what he's, what he's telling us to do is what we need to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, if he's telling you to do something at the, and, and, and in a certain moment, it's probably because it's like, the best time for it to, for that something to be done, and yeah, just to reiterate again, it's not about our own, our own abilities. Um, you know, Zechariah four verse six says, "It's not by power, it's not by might, but by my spirit," says the Lord of hosts. So like, God never leaves us alone, and that's something we also have to remember. Like we always have help, we always have we always have help from the Holy Spirit, and He's the one that does the work through us. Um, and yeah, that's all I really wanted to say. But like, just just to close off, like, just trust in Him. Um, and like, if you're if you're someone that has like been like that God has instructed to do something, and you felt like fear about that instruction, like I'm 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 just I'm right there with you, like and just like um, it's something that <laughs> it, it, it takes practice to really just like um, trust in Him. Sometimes like it can it can be difficult, but it is the best thing that He's telling you. Like what He's telling you is the best thing to do, um, and yeah, just just to remember that.